Because as long as our identity is rooted in something that is not actually who we are, as long as we believe ourselves to be something that is not true and uh, authentic to our natural being, for that long, we will continue to make choices on behalf of this idea that we are this something, right? On behalf of this mistaken identity. And this is the true source of all suffering, the acting, feeling, and thinking on behalf of a mistaken identity is the reason why we experience pain and hardship and distortions in our life. So the purpose of us coming together is to remember the truth of who and what we are. We are consciousness. We are universal consciousness, one with the infinite creator. The entire experience of life is here only for us and only here to support us in our unfolding, our evolution, our self-realization. So this is the, the core of our coming together, remembering the truth essentially about the self, remembering the truth about who and what we are. So I want to invite you to just take a breath and if this is the subject matter that you are interested in, and if awakening in this lifetime, awakening out of these cycles of suffering, and today's topic is, of course, our reinterpretation of karma and coming to learn how do we transcend the cyclical nature of programming, suffering, um, aversion, and attachment, all of this that we can essentially call karma. So before we dive right in, I want to invite you to take a deep breath, perhaps close your eyes for a moment, and really take a moment to dedicate this time that you are giving to participate in, in this experience. Dedicate it to your awakening. Dedicate it to your enlightenment. Dedicate it to your happiness, to your fulfillment, to your being of service to the creator. Yeah, so just allow yourself now to take a quick moment. Become present here and now and feel this sense of dedication because we are here not for information, but for transformation. I have no interest in speaking with you about concepts and ideas. I have deep interest in journeying with you through true transmutation so that we can put into practice, into our living experience, these spiritual principles, these actions within consciousness to literally transform the fabric and the nature of our lives. So with that being said, welcome. And as we begin today's conversation about karmic cycles, karma, let's first get a moment, take a moment to define what, what is this thing, right? Because if we typically just refer to uh, pop culture, right? The pop culture, meaning the popular culture, the ideas that circulate within the collective. And somebody talks about karma. The first thing that people think about is retribution, punishment. Oh, you did something it's going to come back around and bite you, right? So remember that most of the ideas that you hear and see in the world are actually the exact reversal or the upside down perception that A Course in Miracle talks about. It is how the egoic um, mechanism within our mind goes about interpreting reality. So likewise, with this idea of karma, karma, we can look at it uh, at a couple of different ways. We can say, oh, this is just a concept. Let's throw it away. It's irrelevant because the truth is just here now. That's one way. And we will touch on this. This is the cut through path. But there's another way of looking at karma as universal law, right? The idea that whatever we sow, whatever, then let's just take a pure example of this, of like sowing an apple seed, right? Planting an apple seed. What's going to happen? As we sow, so shall we reap. So when we plant an apple seed, we are not going to get oranges or lemons or cows. We're going to get apples. And this is because the likeness 
of that initial action is what propagates its effect, right? Cause and effect are one in truth. So the artificial divide that our perception offers us that, oh, I did an action here. So somewhere, sometime in the future, I'm going to have to reap the consequences. Yes, um, you could look at it that way. And when you do look at it that way, your mind, your perception will show you that. It will conform to that idea, right? Because again, perception is projection. This is another core principle that is covered in the Course in Miracles. And in fact, in, in most of psychology, we understand it to be so that what we are actually perceiving out there is at the very least deeply colored, conditioned, and interpreted by our um, belief structure. And then again, so what is our belief structure? Our beliefs are simply thoughts that we continue to think, right? We, we, we refer to these thoughts as truth. Whenever you refer to anything at all as truth, you are referring to that as God, as law, right? So this is now touching a little bit on that classical idea of idolatry, right? Idols, idolizing. Idolizing what, right? Many people think, oh, it's like, oh, when I think a person is really great, yes, but more importantly, we can become aware of what ideas, what thoughts are we idolizing by making them the truth and seeing them as law. There is no truth and there is no law but God. That is the only truth, the only power. So whenever you ascribe power to a principle, to an idea, to a thought, and you look at that as some kind of independent reality that has power over uh, life experiences or over you, then this is what we may term, if we were using the classical terms, idolatry. This is the idea of ascribing reality with a capital R and truth with a capital T to an idea in our mind. The moment you do this, you have given all of your power to that particular idea or concept. So, and so there are people who do this with the idea and concept and um, law, yeah, maybe, of, cult, uh, of karma, right? So beholding karma and seeing karma as some kind of an external uh, judge, judgment figure, parental figure, right? You can see that really at the core of it, it all starts to weave together into a very childlike interpretation of reality. We as children have been conditioned into the idea of good and bad, right? Good and evil. So when our parents, <laughs> with their wonderful attempt to try and raise us into human beings that are uh, functional and, um, and also, of course, for their sake, easy to control. And this is said with all due respect to our parents, because again, being a, a new parent, I totally get the idea of, oh, it would be really easy if I could come up with some way to control um, my child so that my time is, is freed. I don't have to deal with things that I don't want. What if I could just scare them with a concept, right? Perhaps innocently so on the part of the parent, simply trying to gain their sanity and their control of the situation back of their life, right? Because when you have a child, suddenly you have this like X factor in your life. Whereas before you could plan things and you could really engage with life based on your plans and how you think you're, you're going to use your time. When you have a child, all of that changes, right? And so instead of this orderly experience that was due to your order, now you have something that is uncontrollable. And so parents come up with this idea, good boy, good girl, bad girl, bad, bo ba uh, good girl, right? This, this duality. I want to offer you the idea that the way that human beings, most human beings interpret and see reality as well as karma and attribute to karma this same quality is through the lens of good and evil, good and bad. This very childlike, this very innocent way of navigating life and yet deeply flawed and, and, and constructed in a way 
Because again, we, we may think, oh, it's the parents, oh, it's the grandparents, it's, it's the, no, it isn't. It's the dream matrix programming. It is designed to be this way. The matrix is using the people that are plugged into the matrix to propagate its own end. What is the end of the matrix? The end of the matrix is control. Why? <laughs> because control is the very life source, the very substance, the food of the matrix system. Without control, there is no matrix. Without your attention being given to something that generates suffering and that negative emotion with you, within you, there is no matrix. There is no separation. This whole game is over. Because when you live in pure love and peace, love and joy, then you are living in the conditions of the kingdom, which is where we are again in truth. So the experience of being in the world rather than in the kingdom is the experience, as A Course in Miracles explains, of dreaming, of being in the heavenly kingdom, dreaming of exile. Another way to put, about it, put, put this into words is to say, we are playing a game, right? The children of God are playing this, this elaborate game using the full power, presence, and energy of God to create this incredible matrix. And yet, <laughs> as part of the game, we have given the matrix seemingly its own life. We have given it our consent and our power to, in essence, act as an arbitrary reality, as, as something that is an external source of power. We have entered into, in other words, duality went from the one power presence and substance of God into seemingly now good and bad. So when human beings evolve in the context of good and bad, we essentially then see the world through the lens of there being two powers, the power of good, which is what we are uh, beckoned to be both by our parents, by society, etc. Although something smells fishy about it is even as children, because we see, oh, what the good is always what you want me to do. So what, why is that? Why, how come what I want to do is just like run around and again, as children, maybe like we want to bang pots and we want to climb on our furniture. We want to explore life. That's bad. But then sitting here orderly, eating my food, not making a mess. That's good. Right, So we begin to see that even at the level of that initial parental influence, we are essentially being conditioned to be controlled, right? And then this propagates further into religion, right? The great, the great what? Savior or the great controller, right? Remember that in this world, the ego, the dream matrix, is using everything for its purpose, including religion. So religion also is the propagator of control. It is the idea, again, of good is doing as we tell you to do. Charity, donations, um, you know, do this and not that according to our set of rules. What about that religion? They say that that thing is, that's fine. And, but, oh, right. So then we have, we basically have these different, again, parental like figures. And the truth is that most human beings never grow up to actually question this. And we, we continue to, to some degree, question it and to some degree smell that, wait, something is off. It's not, it's not, it doesn't feel true that this is, that, that, that this system is leading me to fulfillment, to freedom, to peace, love, and joy. And yet we fear, we fear that maybe they were saying the truth. What if I do end up going to hell if I'm bad? What if I, what if I am missing my opportunity to get into heaven because I'm not giving enough money to the church? These types of ideas, right? rooted in our innocence. Because again, we all come in here as this fresh baby, this open, trusting presence of like, hey, wow, like I'm here, I'm here to listen to you. I'm going to, I'm going to learn how to navigate my life based on your, your leadership and your example. 
And then this thing starts to unfold where instead of being led through love, we're being led by the mechanisms of control, which is fear and guilt to get us to do what we want. So coming back to the idea of karma, now karma is yet another thing, another concept or idea that we project these qualities onto. And then now we see karma perhaps then again, so in the pop culture as this great punisher, this, this like equalizer. If somebody does something bad, something bad will happen to them, right? It's a very, it's very similar actually to the Old Testament idea of the, an eye for an eye, you know, etc. But then the Christ came in and say, hey, but wait a second, are you serious? Like eye for an eye is going to make the whole world blind. Could that really be the solution? Could that really be the way to salvation, to awakening, to true peace, love, and joy, to abiding in the kingdom of heaven? No, it can't. And yet, here's where we start to mature in our understanding, in our um, understanding of what karma is, because we can see that every action produces a particular reaction. Every cause produces a particular effect. And we are picking up on this pattern as we move through life, right? Because in essence, what does the word karma really mean? In and of itself, karma means action, right? Oh, well, we're talking about action. Then what, what's, then what's action got to do with our awakening and enlightenment? Here's the thing, that action is what proves your faith, right? You must have heard, or you may have heard this type of um, quote or this idea, right? This phrase that, Faith without works is dead, right? This is a, a scriptural um, quote, right? Faith without works is dead. What is works? Works is action. Works is, so, so in essence, what that quote is saying is that if you don't prove your faith, which is what you say you believe, if you don't prove it with your action, if you are just lip service type of faithful <laughs> Uh, man or woman only, then, then you are, as as the scriptures say, as good as the Pharisees, right? Who are just like, oh yes, uh, I pray for this, I pray for that, but but where's your action? Like where, what what is what is it that in your day to day action where you are um, engaging with life? What is it that shows your faith in God? What is it that shows uh, you? Number one, you forget anybody else. What shows and demonstrates for you, and this is a good question for us to really slow down and ponder here, what shows you in your day-to-day -day life that you believe that the reality is the reality of God, right? What, what is it in your day-to-day -day actions that reveals to you that you believe in the infinite creator's uh, power, presence, and love? right? What is it that shows to you that you believe that you are not a body? What actions do you take through your body that reveal to you that love is the only reality that you believe in? The reason why karma is action is because action is what actually reveals our faith, the true faith right? Our faith may not be in God at all. It may be in punishment. It may be in separation. It may be in guilt and shame. We believe in these things. And so we take action on them. Yeah. There's a beautiful quote from Rumi, Rumi, the great Sufi poet, so much, <laughs> so much beauty in his words. Uh, but he, one of these quotes is he says, move, move, but don't move the way fear makes you move. Yeah. So if we move, in other words, if we take action based on fear, we based on something fearful, right? We're, we're afraid. We're afraid of a karmic consequence. And so we take action based on that, right? Let's say that you, um, I don't know, you, you want to steal something. <laughs> 
I don't imagine any of you want to steal something, but maybe you want to win an argument. Maybe you really believe like, wow, if I really convince this person of, of this particular perspective, then we'll both have more peace. Hmm? But then you say, oh, maybe convincing, no, this is, this is, maybe that's going to actually have a negative consequence on me. Maybe that's going to bring bad energy to me, right? Trying to dominate this person. Oh, no, I'm not going to do it because of that. Whatever thing that we do, if the reason that we do it has nothing to do with peace, love, and joy, has nothing to do with truth and our devotion, then whatever action we take, be it from fear, from guilt, from shame, even if it's in our mind we're doing something good to avoid something, we are propagating that because we've placed our faith in fear, in guilt, in, in separation, right? And the moment that we place our faith into something and we express it as action, we have just, uh, we have just manifested, expressed, put our stake in the ground of, uh, of, of, of what it is that we, we really believe in. So we have sowed our seed and we may think, oh, but it is a seed of kindness. You know, I didn't dominate that person because, you know, but actually it could be a seed of fear. It could be a seed of guilt. And then when that seed is coming to sprout, and again, remember, we're, we're going to explore two perspectives here. The perspective through time, which is closer to the pop culture perspective of karma. And then we're going to explore the vertical, which is the transcendence of karma. But in the idea of planting a seed, you have now sowed another seed of fear. You have now sowed another seed of self uh self-servingness essentially right the idea that's expressed in the law of one of service to self versus service to other the negative polarity of service to self and the positive polarity of service to other these are two of the ways that this dream matrix is evolving and you can involve in both paths so the more service to self seeds that you sow in the fabric of your life the more of that type of negative harvest you begin to experience. And yet, even in this context, the context based on time, because remember, again, time doesn't exist in reality. Time is, a, is, a, is an essential mechanism of the dream matrix. And the idea of being a separate body, having a causal effect on other bodies, this is, again, an entirely dream matrix idea, concept, and construct. This does not exist in the kingdom. We are not separate bodies. Actually, if we really go deep down and we start to touch into the vertical, there is no doer of action that is separate from the universal will, right? The will of God is omnipotent. Where is there any room for you as seemingly a separate body and a separate being? Where is there any room for you to use your will? if the will of God is omnipotent? Well, did you wrestle away some little bit of will from God and now you are your own doer and decider, right? I hope the way that I'm speaking here, uh, even though it is paradoxical, I hope it is making sense to you and you're able to follow me here. Of course, drop drop your questions into the chat um, if um, if there's anything that you want to uh, want me to elaborate on. But the core of this, the core of this being that when we engage with life and we take action, all of that action is always based on what we have faith in. This is why when we are sowing seeds of karma and we reap them, this, this path, this path through time, which does not exist and in which uh, we are entirely dreaming, yet this too, this too, just like everything in life and in the dream matrix has been co-opted by the Holy Spirit. In essence, th this is coming back to that quote that I mentioned many times, man may have meant it for evil, but God means it for good. So there's literally nothing that can happen in this dream matrix that is not leading you ultimately to your complete liberation. Nothing at all is going to stand in the way and everything 
that seems to stand in the way is going to be used to propel you forward, to springboard you into, into your ultimate self-realization, God-realization. So this is where we can really find that sense of peace, contextual peace, and knowing that no matter how wrong I get it, no matter how bad things seem to be, there is another way of looking at this. And that other way is continuously being broadcast by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is that part of your mind. Again, remember, there's nothing external to you. The Holy Spirit is that part of the, your mind that is completely lucid, that is, in essence, lucid dreaming this dream and is aware that this is a dream, aware of your ultimate reality, and therefore guiding you and offering you this, this direction to say, hey, um, maybe, maybe you don't want to continue to propagate suffering. Hey, remember, remember who you are, right? But if you don't listen at that level, then here is the beautiful uh, progressive path that is available and that we certainly should make use of. Uh, that progressive path is the path of the catalysts. Right? So whatever seeds you have sown into the ground of awareness, into reality, whatever faith you have proven, be that faith in punishment, in fear, in, um, in shame, or be that faith in, in oneness, in, um, in connection, in love, right? Each of these seeds is always sprouting in your day-to-day -day life and appearing as moments, either moments of grace. So these are the, when, when you, we open our perspective, we begin to see the synchronicities between these moments and our, our past experiences. And they, they become highlighted to us as something, um, as something to pay attention to. So the, so the seeds that we have sown come up as catalysts and these catalysts express themselves either as moments of grace in which you receive something out of nowhere. Like somebody is just pours so much love into you. I had this beautiful experience with my wife uh, a few weeks ago. Um, it like our schedule and everything was supposed to go this way. And I had these responsibilities and yet I was also struggling inwardly. Like I had, I was carrying some weight and there's, there's so many different projects, et cetera. I was, I was managing and then suddenly, in this moment where life's supposed to go this way, she showed up with this incredible grace and wisdom and support and, and, and guidance and just um, medicine of, of the soul. And so um, what this did was completely turn not only my day around, but my week around. So sometimes we have these moments of harvest that we receive, right? And the, the way to receive them is with gratitude, right? But then sometimes we have the moments of the, uh, so to speak, negative seed, the negative polarity sprouting and bringing us its fruit. And that is experienced as a trigger, right? That's where we are triggered into feeling angry or frustrated or annoyed or sad or um, feeling a sense of loss and lack, right? Um, anger, um, all of these different types of negative emotions, they are also, basically, they are just seeds that are popping into fruition in your day-to-day -day moment. So as you are kind of going along with your day, living your life, and then boop, like a phone call comes in, somebody says something, the weather turns a certain way, there's traffic, whatever it is, is completely irrelevant. But what you are receiving in this moment is that gift, is that catalyst, is that um, revelation of here is the fruit of what you planted. Yeah. So when you, when you see these fruits, here's the opportunity to transcend these karmic cycles because the way that you meet that very moment, just that one simple moment is going to either collapse time as A Course in Miracles talks about by turning, by basically applying 
a miracle, meaning miracle working, this transmutational experience of having something come in that's seemingly negative or challenging. And instead of you contracting, collapsing, and re replaying that pattern, you expand in the face of contraction. You open your heart because you are remembering, right? Because you're remembering what? You are remembering that this is an opportunity. This is a catalyst that this thing called karma is being used right now by the Holy Spirit, is being used by love, by, 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 by divinity, by your true self to liberate you. What else could it be here for? Everything is here to liberate you. Everything is on the way and never in the way. But only when you see it that way. Yeah, and here's the crux because... You can share this to others, and if they're in a different mindset, if they're experiencing victim consciousness in that in that moment, there's no way they can see it. And to them, it's almost as if you are gaslighting them and saying, or or like spiritual bypassing or whatever it is. To you, the perspective may be totally clear that this difficult thing that's happening is here to liberate me. And I'm going to take action again, based on my faith in this. Again, so now you have transmuted, you've planted a new seed, you're growing your uh, quotient of polarity and you're polarizing more and more towards what's called the positive polarity, what's called the service to other polarity. Basically, you're polarizing more towards the consciousness and the awareness of love and oneness without any obstacles. This is... This is what's happening from your point of view when you're grounded in this awareness. Others may see it completely differently, but they're on their own path as it comes to the unfolding of that particular moment, right? So in this progressive path of transmuting karma, we get to see that karma is actually an opportunity to choose again, period. That's all it is in the place of where we in the past chose with something other than peace, love, and joy, now by grace, <laughs> by this karmic grace, we get to see a moment like this again and we get to choose differently. I choose to see a future different from the past, right? This is our opportunity. This is what we're being called for. The, 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 the true uh, overarching principle is that we are always choosing our state of mind. Yeah. But we are choosing it not for this body or our avatar. We are choosing the state of mind for the universe, for all of creation, right? Because remember, all minds are joined, right? And uh, I, m my thinking is going to affect what other people are perceiving, right? We are never alone. I am never alone in the, ex in the effects, in experiencing the effects of my thought, yeah? So this idea of thought, this idea of state of mind, this idea of perspective, this idea is the place where we are applying choice. And by our choice, by our ability to choose differently. And we'll go through some examples to make this a little bit more concrete, because again, remember, we're interested here in transformation, not information. Don't walk away with concepts, walk away with clear practice, action at the level of consciousness that literally liberates you. So when these moments arise and we are seeing a trigger come up, the best thing that we can do is and sometimes this is difficult in the moment of the trigger, but if we apply the practices that we've been talking about through the previous weeks, where we've talked about the practice of mental rehearsal, right? Of basically seeing, okay, like at the start of your day, you sit down, you say, okay, today I may meet some catalysts. Today I'm going to encounter either grace in the form of love pouring on me, or I'm going to encounter grace in the form of catalysts. Thank you, God, for this day where I have the opportunity to awaken more and more to your presence, to this infinite love, peace, and joy that is intrinsic to what I am. Thank you. Okay. And so 
I then you would do this mental rehearsal, the closing your eyes and follow me here. You can explore this also, right? So we start with this recognition that this day is for awakening, right? It's very important because if you don't have this context, you're going to think that this day is for getting your ego needs met. And, and, and you will simply propagate more of entrenching yourself into these karmic patterns, this unconscious programming. So instead, take a deep breath. <sighs> Close our eyes if that feels comfortable. Connect with this. Here is a new day. This is a new day. One day, one life. I have an opportunity to awaken here today into true peace, love, and joy, into true self-realization. I have this opportunity. So, so how am I going to meet this day? And here's where we apply mental rehearsal. So just think about in the past, right? A moment of trigger, a moment of annoyance, frustration, a moment of fear. And so you just say, okay, so here I am, I'm moving through my day. And then boom, I feel a contraction of energy. What am I going to do? I'm going to remember that this is an opportunity of awakening, that this is actually grace coming into my life, that this is on the way and not in the way. And this is what you're mentally rehearsing. You're seeing yourself basically standing there, sitting there, engaged in life. And then it's almost as if you freeze frame that moment in your mind. Again, remember, we're rehearsing mentally what we're going to do in real life. So a moment of trigger arises. Take a deep breath. This is an opportunity for awakening. This is a catalyst. Okay, wonderful. So what am I going to do now with this catalyst? What am I going to do to transmute it? I'm going to tell the truth about it, right? We've practiced this technique. I'll offer you maybe one more technique, but this, this core technique that we've been working with here and beyond the matrix is the idea of reclaiming your power from the limited creations within your own mind. We've been using the context that, of course, all triggers are happening only here. They're not happening out in seemingly whatever we call is external or objective reality. Uh, if they were, then one thing would trigger everybody. Yeah? Kind of like fire or water. Like one <laughs> element, get like water makes everybody wet. Nobody becomes dry by having water poured on them, right? So this is that thing that we can call objective, okay, for, for now. And I think that even there, there is perhaps ex exceptions. But the, the idea of a trigger, the idea of our emotion and how we feel is happening entirely within, right? So this is our inner world. So what I want you to do is I want you to claim this world, this kingdom, this place, this ground whereon I stand is holy ground. This is where I belong. This is my kingdom. This is my mind. There's nobody else in here and there's nothing to fear in here. Only the fearful things that I create and ascend to, give consent to and say, yes, this is truth like what we talked about in the beginning of our conversation today, we give that reality, we call that truth. And only by that consent within do we have triggers and fearful things happening in our minds. So what we are going to do as we move through our day and we experience catalysts is we're going to recognize that this is an inner experience. And what is the truth? The truth is that this experience of this trigger is made up only of my power, my energy, and my presence. There is no other ingredients here. Or we can say, because there really is no you as a separate being from God, we can say that it is simply the power, presence, and energy of God that I am using to create this limited creation that is... Uh, Maybe it was functional at one point, but now feels like suffering, now feels like a limitation. And so I now choose to reclaim all of that energy, power, and presence. I choose to reclaim it on behalf of love, 
right? And we're making this new choice. Wherever we chose unlovingly, we're making a new loving choice. So what is a loving choice when you are experiencing a trigger? And what is a trigger except self-attack, right? Who is the first person to hurt when you are experiencing frustration, annoyance, anger, right? Or when you're experiencing loss, lack, sadness, right? It's you. You're the first person to hurt. This is why all attack is self-attack. And so what is the loving thing to do at the level where you made a choice to attack yourself is to turn it around and love yourself instead. So you say, okay, all of this energy, this thing that I'm feeling as frustration. So feeling that energy, the energy of the emotion, emotion, energy, emotion, right? We're feeling this. We're claiming it. This, all this is is my own energy. This is actually the power and presence and energy of God that I am misusing to create suffering for myself. Let me turn this around. I now recall and reclaim all of this energy, all of this power and presence. I call it back to me now. I feel it flowing back to me now. I feel it flowing into my heart, integrating into my heart, and I remember now who and what I am. I am the power and presence of God. I am the extension of the infinite creator. And this simple process of literally pulling this back and feeling and remembering yourself to be uh, what you are in truth, remembering your true self, this is the most loving act that you can do towards yourself. Because as you remember who and what you are, the innocence that you are, the purity that you are, the holiness that you are, then... I promise you, if you, and I, I imagine some of you have already tried this, that, and you know what happens, that you go from this state of contraction to a state of elation, right? And that may only last for one second. Don't give up because the next moment you can come back and you can again see, oh, I got re-triggered. Amazing. Another opportunity, right? So if you do this, it's almost like taking a bucket and scooping water out of like a swamp. And over time, that swamp is going to get emptied. And whatever was brewing in that swamp that uh, were all these unconscious patterns and beliefs and karmic cycles and programs, they start to be revealed. And as they're revealed, and as this water that was giving them life, which is your attention, but your unconscious attention and consent, uh, as this becomes drained, their power becomes drained. And so all of these patterns simply fall away. And this is the very uh, essence of transmuting and ending the patterns of karma, ending the cycles, coming out of them, awakening out of them, and actually starting to see karma is simply the opportunity to make a loving choice. That's all it is. That's all it ever was. It was always forever your ally in your journey of awakening. Mm -hmm. So take a deep breath and just let that kind of percolate and let that um, possibility of navigating life through this lens, um, just explore it for a moment, lean into it, have a sense of like, hey, what if that's how it was? What if I were to move through life and see everything as on the way? And even those things that are challenging, what if I start to realize what they're actually here for? What is their true function? And you know what? You know what the true function of anything is? It is what you use it for. That is its true function. Because the question is always, what am I using this for? What are you using karma for? Are you using it for your awakening liberation? Are you using it for peace, love, and joy? Or are you using it to propagate more suffering, guilt, punishment, separation? That's up to you. And this is where we come to that core principle, that overarching principle of you are always, we are always, I am always choosing my state of mind and I'm choosing it for all the world. This is why there is karma is because nothing is separate. All minds are joined. And so what we're choosing here, we're choosing for everybody. And if you allow yourself to feel that power, that responsibility, then choosing love, choosing peace, choosing joy, 
it becomes natural. It becomes the very essence of what it is. And you are, you, you can never separate somebody else's joy or peace or them feeling love from your own peace, love, and joy. It becomes impossible because it is impossible in truth. So now let's take a look at the second aspect. We have some time before we're wrapping up. The other aspect of transcending karma by understanding and seeing the vertical dimension of time. In other words, the whole idea of karma depends on time. The whole idea of karma depends on separation. How could there be karma if there are no separate beings? Do you have karma like with yourself? Like what, you know, like this hand is wrestling this hand or taking something away or doing some action towards it or saying some things. No, right? When you are one whole being, what karma could there be? Like what action can you take if all is one? Yeah. So this is why when we're talking about the kingdom and we're talking about God, we talk about these terms like uh, eternal, unchanging, unalterable, stainless, unbound, right? Forever, always, um, beyond time, beyond change, beyond space. What karma is there in that dimension? It's nothing, right? It's zero. There is no karma. How could there be karma if there could be no change? When we talk about the infinite creator as total perfection, it is already perfect. It is complete and perfect. There is no evolution. God is not evolving. The eternal one, the omnipotence, omniscience, uh, omnipresence is not evolving towards a higher state. If it were evolving towards a higher state, it would not be what it is. It would be some form of moving towards another potential, where, but then what is the ultimate context of that? There, this would be just simply something moving within that ultimate context, the ultimate context being God, which is changeless, eternal, and perfect. So if we become aware of this reality, of this perspective, then we realize that the whole idea and the whole conversation that we just had about karma is from this vertical perspective irrelevant. In this context, the only thing that is required for you to be entirely free forever and always is the awareness of the presence of God. In other words, it's the awareness of the present moment or more accurately put, this holy instant now. So when we realize that now is the only reality that there is, we engage now with, with basically what it is that we are uh, believing to be true about the self, right? So unconsciously, we engage now as our avatar, as our body-mind complex, and we engage with it and we're we're interacting and what are we doing we're proving our faith that we are a separate being and therefore that instant karma is revealing to us instantly in this moment that yes you are a separate being right in this way we can look at karma simply as the mirror the mirror of now the 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 immediate confrontation with with essentially giving and receiving yeah. So whenever we are unaware of our true self and we operate as the separate self, we are primarily trying to give to receive, right? And what we receive, we want to take and keep. Yeah. Giving to receive and taking and keeping is essentially the way that we perpetuate suffering in the instant of now. Because remember, again, as the Course in Miracles says, that giving and receiving are one in truth. And so what that really means is that whatever you are giving, be that 
peace, love, and joy, or be that condemnation, shame, guilt, etc., is what you are receiving now. It's happening now. You're feeling it now. You're experiencing it now. Yeah? And so in approaching karma through this vertical dimension, the emphasis is on this awareness of giving and receiving, the flow of what it is that we're giving, which is proving our faith in what we think we are, and the idea of receiving what we give. This is simply an awareness. When you give a gift in the moment, a gift of a smile, a gift of forgiveness, a gift of, and again, what is forgiveness except seeing this moment without the shadow of the past? Yeah, this is, this is the transcendence of karma here and now. Now, how do we see it without the shadow of the past? Of course, we are aware of the past still, but we realize that that past is simply an illusion. It does not exist here and now. It has no existence at all, right? So when we are approaching karma from the point of view of here and now, we are simply dealing with what is the output. And perhaps this is a very simple way, or perhaps this is kind of abstract and removed, but we are simply dealing with what is it that I give in this moment and paying attention to this quality and receiving that quality simultaneously, meaning being sensitive to it, not waiting for time to accumulate a certain amount of karma and then boom, pop it into our reality. But instead, we are sensitive and we are savoring and tasting the experience of what we give in each moment, how it feels like, what is the expression, what faith is it proving? And we are as we are giving, we are, we are sensing, we're feeling, we're receiving that, right? And as long as we continue to abide in this awareness, then the very same thing happens as we explored in the first uh, iteration, in the first example of the progressive uh, uh, transmutation of karma. But that's happening without our paying attention to time. It's happening simply in the moment. As things arise, we're meeting them with love. As things arise, we're meeting them with love. And so on we go. And the, what forms the foundation of allowing us to meet things as love is our sensitivity to the truth that giving and receiving are one. When you know that giving and receiving are one, there's no need for you to wait for karma. There's no need for you to, to see the, the, the effect of a cause. You are sensitive to it right away. Um, you know, I think we feel that in many experiences, we think back as, for example, as children, and let's say we're doing something that we know we shouldn't be doing, and yet we're doing it anyway. Yes, you know, we feel a certain maybe glee of like, oh, yeah, I'm getting to do what I want. But also we feel that guilt. Also, we feel the shame, right? And and just being sensitive to that, like as you would enter into it, you'd just be like, oh, actually, I don't want to go there. I just tasted what that feels like. Um, so I don't want to give that. What do I want to give instead? And what I want to wrap this particular um, aspect up with is or this particular conversation of, of transmuting and, and essentially exiting karmic cycles through the awareness of present or now and the awareness of the flow of giving and receiving in the now is this, uh, again, quote from Course in Miracles, which is talking about that only what we are withholding in any moment can ever be missing. Whatever you are not giving is the only thing that's missing in any moment. So in, again, this vertical awareness, when you, like, what could the trigger be, right? What could you feel other than peace, love, and joy? Well, it's the idea that something's missing, right? Maybe respect is missing and you wanted respect from that person. Maybe abundance is missing and you wanted to have a plenty of something in that moment. Or maybe something disappeared from your reality. You wanted that to be here. Um, any one of these. Or maybe you feel like you really need to control something. Or otherwise, it will go wrong. Right? Feeling like you are the doer and you're in control. All of these things, 
These are examples of something missing. When we feel fear, what's missing is the awareness that uh, actually I'm in the mind of God. God is the only reality. There's only one will, one power, and one presence. I am the expression of the author, right? I am being authored by the infinite creator here and now. Let me tune into this authorship and express it fully. Uh, yeah, and accurately. So that's what's missing when you are feeling fear is the awareness of the presence of God. What's missing when you're feeling anger or frustration or annoyance? What's missing is that you think that your happiness lives in a particular future moment or a particular constellation of cofactors, a particular circumstance. You need that outcome to be happy. What's missing? What's missing is the awareness that uh, happiness does not abide in, a, in an outcome. Happiness is an intrinsic quality of who and what you are. And the idea of you're projecting it into a particular outcome and then trying to chase it is what's creating the, 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 the anger, the frustration, or the annoyance. So what's missing is simply the awareness that, oh, happiness is already within me. I don't need to chase it in anything. I was under the illusion that it would be in that outcome, right? And likewise, when you're experiencing lack or loss or sadness, the what, what's missing? What's missing is what you're not giving. What are you not giving? You're not giving the awareness that uh, there can be no lack in reality. There can be no loss. There's appearances appearing and disappearing, but that does not imply that things are missing or, or are lost, right? I could say right now I'm, I'm lacking an elephant, but you can say that in any moment about anything. Does that make... Does that, does that form the foundation of like some kind of principle by which we should suffer? No, it's just a perspective that we take. I can always, we can always say that something's missing and we can always, um, you know, in essence, feel that lack, but whatever is missing is what we're not giving. So what, what is that quality that you feel was missing? Like you, maybe you say, oh, this person, you know, they went away from me, so I don't feel as loved. Well, where is love except within you? Right? So it's always that whatever is missing is what we're not giving. So give, bringing that quality forth and giving it in the moment to yourself and through yourself to whatever the situation is, is the very transmutation of karma and those karmic cycles. It is the meeting of the catalyst in a way that uh, furthers your evolution and liberates you from that particular entanglement with duality. So let's take another deep breath and just allow that to integrate. I hope this was helpful to you um, and, and practical as well. So in summary, we have essentially two ways that we can address and transmute karma. Or in other words, if we put aside this whole trappings of karma, it's simply cyclical patterns and programs that lead to suffering or that are, uh, that feel like suffering, yeah? So in order for us to move beyond suffering, which is always self-caused, we do one of two things. We either understand that we are planting seeds of either grace or uh, challenge, yeah? We, we're either plant planting seeds of positive or negative polarity. The positive polarity comes back and blooms and feels like a gift and like a grace and like, wow, what did I do to deserve this? Well, it's what you planted. That's what you did. Um, or it comes back as a catalyst that feels like a trigger. And that trigger, again, gives us the opportunity to reclaim our power, to embrace it again, to remember who and what we are, to also bringing in the other component of give whatever seems to be missing in the moment and thereby transmute and close that cycle, completing that experience. Or we become aware that now is the only reality, that here and now there's a flow of giving and receiving. Giving and receiving are always one in truth and only what I am withholding can ever be missing in any moment. And by this principle, we begin to navigate uh, moment by moment, feeling the flow of giving and receiving. Whenever something is missing, we become aware. What is it that I'm not giving that is missing in this moment? And we bring forth that quality and consciousness and we express it through our works in both cases. It is through our action, which is another name for karma, that we prove our faith in, in the reality that 
we in 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 the reality that we ascribe reality to in that which we believe to be true right and that is what ends up forming our context the context of our life and each moment in each choice either contributes to us awakening to the revelation that we are here and now in the kingdom of heaven within the mind of god or to furthering the illusion that we are a separate being uh being battered around by forces of karma yeah so thank you very very much it's always a pleasure to be here with you if you are live here with us on zoom then i absolutely invite you to um, raise your hand if you want to have a conversation, if you have questions, if you'd like some coaching based on what we've been talking about, um, or if you want to share something relevant, maybe you've had an experience, I absolutely invite you to, um, to jump in and share in this way. And if you're watching on YouTube, there's a link in the description so you can join us live next time. So for now, I wish you all the very best. If you're watching on YouTube, take great care and I look forward to seeing you again.